All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's uh, Julian and Segolin, and uh, we're back for episode four of Stage Maker Fridays. And we have a huge change this week. As you can see, we are not in the Paris office. <laughs> uh, we are in separate locations because we are in lockdown again. Yes, but uh, yes. this is not going <laughs> to stop us <laughs> from uh, from uh, meeting all of you out there and. Um, and helping you with machine learning right so well you know i'll just introduce myself again but you know us by now so i'm julian i'm a principal developer advocate working on ai and machine learning and of course we have segolen with us hello everyone so my name is segolen and i'm a senior data scientist working with the aws machine learning solution lab all right and uh, thank you again for joining <laughs> us uh, sego uh so we're ready for this. Uh, it's a bit of a crazy time for everyone here, but we'll manage it. Okay, so we are live, as you can guess, and uh, please ask us all your questions. We have uh, machine learning specialists wa waiting for your questions, and uh, and don't be shy, right? I keep saying this, but don't be shy. Ask all your questions. And make sure you learn as much as possible and our team will help you out and thanks to everybody who's helping us with this uh with this session again today thank you we appreciate it so let's get started now so in previous episodes we talked about predictive maintenance we talked about demand forecasting and last week we did fraud detection okay so this week we're we're actually going to do something a little different of course, we're going to look at a business problem, which is um, uh, uh, credit uh, decisions. Um, but we're also going to focus on explaining how the model predicts, right? The, the whole explainability thing, uh, really, really big topic. So Segolen, can you tell us a little bit about the, the content today? What are we going to learn? So uh, today we are going to work on a very interesting, interesting real-world uh, use case. Um, let's say you want to apply for a credit at, at your bank for buying a new dishwasher <laughs> because you are that. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It broke, yes. <laughs> it broke, yes. All right. And um, based on your uh, some of your personal data, uh, the bank will approve or reject uh, your uh, application. But uh, you can be very frustrated if the bank uh, denies it without giving you some uh, explanation. And mm -hmm. you would even say that the decision is quite arbitrary and uh, right. you would like to know uh, what kind of factor had a negative impact uh, on your application. And mm. uh, this is what we are going to do today. Uh, okay. We're going to first uh, buy, build a classifier uh, to approve or reject a credit application based on personal data. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we will understand how the model predicts uh, the uh, response uh, mm -hmm. by introducing some explainability into the results of our ML model. Okay, that's um, nice. Yeah, and indeed, um, model explainability is the degree uh, to which humans uh, can understand the cause of decision uh, made by a machine learning model. Mm -hmm. And after this episode, you won't say anymore that uh, ML models are only some black balls full of witchery. Oh, <laughs> well, that's actor. okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see about that. So when you say humans can understand machine learning models, you mean uh, real humans, right? Not data scientists. Right? Exactly. Normal real people. <laughs> like Normal me. Normal people. <laughs> or or okay, even my so, grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is great. Uh, yeah, we, we really try, you know, we really need to crack the, the mystery of, of uh, machine learning prediction. And... Uh, and it's a it's a big it's a big concern for a lot of companies, a lot of customers, mm -hmm. especially if you work in highly regulated industries mm -hmm. um, like financial services or healthcare. You know, you just have to you know it's not it's not just enough to give an answer. You have to explain why yeah. you came up with the answer. So, uh, okay, tell tell us a little more about the tools we're going to use today, and then we'll discuss the the use case in more detail. Um, so uh, today we are going. Uh, to do, um, as I mentioned, a classification model uh, based on a data set containing uh, features that describe uh, credit application 
and its applicants. Okay. Uh, and in order to do so, we are not going to use the famous uh, XGBoost algo we already mentioned last week, uh -huh. but uh, another gradient boosting model, the light uh, GBM, uh, and we are going to use the site learn uh, on Amazon Search Maker to do so. And okay. then uh, we will explain decision uh, near the results of our model using SHAP. Uh, in a few words, uh, it will help us to understand which features have the most impact uh, on the bank decision. Okay, well, that's really good stuff. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, SHAP or, or SHAPE or however I you want to pronounce it. <laughs> Um, so French, sorry, shape. <laughs> <laughs> probably shape. Yes, let's go with shape. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's it's coming up a lot, right? I think it's it's one of those. There are different uh, techniques for model explainability, and uh, and I think shape is uh, is is a really interesting one. So I'm I'm really curious what we're gonna learn here. So we're going to go pretty deep again. You know us, right? We we can't help but uh, go deep on this stuff. We love it. We hope you love it too. So get some coffee, get anything, whatever you need to keep you awake in the next hour, and. Um, and we're going to get ready, right? So, as usual, all of it is is online. Uh, let me show you the uh, the repo we're going to use. Um, here it is. Okay. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Um, so it's another uh, another great uh, repository built by our machine learning teams. Um, you can find all of those are under the AWS Labs repo and then this is one called SageMaker explaining credit decisions okay and uh, and this one is um, it's particularly interesting because uh, as we will see later on it, it uses additional uh, AWS services it's not just uh, training and deploying uh, it also generates a data set it also um, uses a bunch of uh, extra services in in the process so uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that but it's a very very good one I, I really really recommend it mm -hmm. okay um, so we're gonna dive into this but as always our focus is not just click 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 in the notebook we want to understand why we're even doing this. So let's discuss the, the, the problem and how we're going to solve it. So yes, it is a classification problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we already discussed this in the in the fraud detection episode, and we use, I believe, XGBoost there to, to solve it. And I, I would say it, it's kind of a similar problem, right? Binary classification, yes or no. Uh, do you get does your credit get approved or not? So we'll we'll look at this, of course, but uh, it's not so different from what we've done before. Uh, I think we should focus on the explainability problem. Um, but of course, we have to explain what explainability means, right? And <laughs> Sego, help us. <laughs> <laughs> big question. Um, yeah. No, so let's start with a simple linear regression model. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's quite uh, straightforward to read the model output. Uh, the sign of each coefficient uh, indicates the degree and the direction of the relationship between joint value of the uh, input variables and the uh, resulting predicted response value. Mm -hmm. And uh, same for a single decision tree. You know, the, mod the model is uh, highly interpretable and uh, my grandmother can read it. But um, most of the time, uh, single sure? decision... <laughs> yes! <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Smart grandmother. Hi, grandma. Smart grandma. <laughs> grandma. Uh, she's a huge fan of Sage Maker. Um, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time, uh, a single decision tree uh, is not enough uh, to model mm. complex types, uh, complex complex tasks uh, on top of uh, huge data sets. Uh, so you need to use uh, advanced model uh, with right. a lot of uh, parameters and uh, honestly you can feel uh, easily lost uh, when you uh, read the model mm -hmm. outputs mm -hmm. but uh, the good news is that nowadays um, many methods uh, exist uh, for formulating uh, explanation uh, from a complex model that are uh, interpretable and uh, faithful and okay. uh, 
as a result, uh, the explanation uh, will give you a way to understand the relationships um, and patterns uh, learned uh, by the machine learning model. Mm -hmm. And this means, what does it mean? It means um, more confidence in the reliability and um, more co confidence in the robustness uh, of the model, of course, for what? For real world uh, deployments. And uh, of course, it is crucial. Uh, it is critical uh, for um, building trust uh, in the in the system. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. And and basic models are easy to understand, but when you move to bigger things and and deep learning, particularly, deep it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. It's it is really uh, uh, impossible to to understand what's going on in there. And like I said, it's a major concern for for customers, you know, and sometimes business and and legal and even human stakes mm. can be very very high. So credit application, of course, um, but I guess energy production, healthcare, you know, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, if you find a cure for something or if you if you use machine learning to to predict whether someone is uh, as a major illness or not you 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 want of course you want accuracy but you want to explain why you know why you came yeah. to this uh, to this conclusion because before you can actually act on that so yeah it's really really critical to to understand how those models work so okay we understand the problem a little bit more and um, let, let's take a look at the data set so um, it, here it's a little bit different. Let me let me show you uh, what the data looks like. Okay. All right. Zooming in, and it's Jason. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I know Segolan is a big fan of Jason, like everyone else. Especially for time series. Yes, absolutely. So where does this come from? So actually, this is um, this is a synthetic data set, right? So it's actually. Uh, built on purpose for this uh, uh, for this example, uh, and it's actually the way this is done is actually pretty clever. Um, so we start uh, when we when we uh, run the, the the example in this repository. We start from a, a CloudFormation template, right? You can launch the CloudFormation template here and build a stack, and it's going to create. Um, yes, it's going to create a whole bunch of different things. And when it comes to the data set, let's focus on the, those icons on the left. So the first thing it's going to create is a Lambda function. So it's a piece of code running on managed infrastructure. And this piece of code is actually going to generate the synthetic data. And it uses a library called Faker. Okay, uh, you'll find the URL on the, on the last slide. So Faker lets us generate... Um, addresses and, and you know people information etc cetera, etc cetera. <laughs> so we generate data sets we have one credit data set when one people data set we have one contact data set and faker is a very cool library by the way uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with it it's it's nice and so we we have those uh i would say uh, uh fake files in s3 right and then um we run a glue job i will explain what glue is <laughs> We run a glue job to generate the actual data set. Okay, and this is the data that's written back to S3 as as mm -hmm. a training set and, and a validation set, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? And uh, whoops, uh, why did I click on this? Sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe I should show you what uh, what Faker is. Here it is. Right. Okay, here's Faker. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very very simple library to generate uh, fake data sets. All right, so it's a good name for it. Uh, again, all <laughs> the links will be on the last slide, so don't worry about the, the resources. Um, and um, okay, all right. So once we have this uh, data ready, you know, as a training set and test set, etc., we use it on SageMaker as as we usually do, right? So a little bit, little bit different. Uh, so glue is a is a fascinating topic, um, but we're we're not going to go extremely deep on it. I'm just going to show you quickly what we're doing here. So first, we have a crawler. A crawler is just exactly what the name is, right? We fetch data 
from uh, so the the raw data written in S3 by the lambda function, we fetch it right, and then we run a job. And as you can imagine, all this stuff takes place on fully managed infrastructure. And running the job really means running a script. And Glue is based on Spark. Okay, so if you guys like Spark, uh, you can uh, you can bring your own script. And you can see here basically we're loading the data. Yeah, let me zoom in a bit. It's probably a little uh, a little hard to read. And um, and then we join, you know, we load those three JSON files that we generated and we join them, et cetera, et cetera. And then we write everything back to, uh, to S3. Okay. And this is how, this is what we get. Okay. So we get JSON lines with numbers, with number of feature. Okay. And you can see each feature, uh, belongs to a certain category, right? So we have a credit category, finance category, um, uh, employment category, etc. And then within those categories, you have the actual features, right? Employment type, employment permit, uh, checking accounts, checking balance, etc., etc. Okay, right. So. Um, it's it's what the data looks like. Uh, I think the reason it's no one would actually use a real life uh, non anonymized data for this, right? <laughs> so uh, you go ask your bank if they can give you a data set, but uh, probably they're going to say no. So this is a good option. And the last uh, <laughs> thing I want to mention is we have uh, a schema as well. Okay, so uh, we uh, that's uh, generated by the script. So we have pretty much the type. Uh, of course, we have a description as well, but the type for each uh, feature, which is useful when we're going to do feature engineering and uh, and feature processing later on. Okay, and uh, and we have about one thousand uh, uh, credit applications in that file. Okay, so not a big data set, but again, uh, we're just trying to uh, uh, to understand how this model predicts. So, you know, toy example, not a lot of data needed. Okay. Uh, all right. So I think we're good on the data set. Um, now let's talk about the algo. So Sego, you mentioned the uh, the, the light uh, GBM algo. Yeah, the new uh, one. <laughs> I hope it's. I, I I'm afraid it's not going to be a light topic, right? But I, you know, and I'm, I'm out of coffee as well. But I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. So can you explain? Uh, can you explain light GBM? A bit? Yeah, sure. So for people who, have, uh, who are interested uh, in this algo, please uh, have a look on the paper. It's like uh, super well explained. But uh, what is light GVM? So uh, what means uh, light GVM? So um, that means a light uh, gradient uh, boosting machine. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a gradient uh, boosting framework that uses a three-based learning algorithm. So we are going to use it uh, through a scikit learn. And uh, this algo is designed uh, to be uh, distributed and efficient, and uh, it can be used for um, regression, uh, binary classification, multi-classification, cross-entropy, etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, let me explain uh, what it means uh, with, uh, real, for real-life data. So, sorry to interrupt. Pretty much the same yeah. problems as, as XGBoost, right? Yeah. Exactly, it's yeah, like okay. classification, right. and um, but after we will see that depending on the data you have, the amount of data you have, sometimes you need to change the algo or, or compare the performance of different right. algo, and uh, like GBM, uh, GBM can be a good candidate uh, in some um, circumstances. Okay. Um, so, uh, LightGBM is a new uh, implementation of the uh, well-known family of the gradient boosting decision tree uh, family, so the GBDT. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we quickly explained uh, last week uh, when we discussed uh, XGBoost and um, in, a, in a summary, uh, GBDT algos um, are some uh, and some uh, build an ensemble of uh, three base models uh, mm. where each tree uh, try to fix the prediction mistakes done by the uh, previous tree. Right. Um, I'm just showing on screen the, 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 the slide from last week, right, where we show the trees and, and, and the, the basic description of, of XGBoost. So, yeah, please continue. 
So um, the, light, the, the new thing, or I mean the, the addition of uh, light uh, GB, GBM is uh, Dieselgo going to add two new techniques um, that address uh, some potential weaknesses of the GBDT implementation, uh, mm -hmm. especially when, it is, uh, when they are applied uh, on a large data set and okay. especially if these large data sets are uh, very sparse. All right. Um, yeah, so the main problem is that uh, in order to build the prediction trees, uh, mm -hmm. this implementation of the GBDT uh, typically, typically scan all the data points uh, to estimate uh, the information gain uh, for all possible split points when the, the, the okay. trees are built. Yeah, the future um, splits. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, okay. exactly. And um, as a consequence, uh, the computational complexity uh, grows quickly. Uh, with the number of features and the, uh, with the number of uh, data points. Mm, okay. So this is uh, why um, implementing some traditional GBDT uh, on a large data set uh, can be uh, very uh, time consuming. Mm, okay. So yeah. So you actually spend lots of time in the training process to explore. Exactly all possible splits on all possible um, data points. Okay, I can see why that would be a problem. Uh, now, you mentioned two techniques, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid to ask, but, <laughs> let, okay, you guys want to know, and I, I guess I want to know. So, what are the names of those two techniques? <laughs> So it's not scary. Uh, uh, the, the first one, the first technique, um, um, is the uh, is called the GOTH. So it uh, means the gradient based uh, one side sampling. And uh, the second one is called the second technique is the EFB exclusive uh, feature bundling. Okay, why did um, I ask that question? Okay, but <laughs> now, now now you have to explain what that means. <laughs> So the intuition is quite, it's quite simple uh, in reality because uh, you want uh, to uh, filter a little bit uh, your uh, data uh, mm -hmm. and uh, these two uh, techniques are going to act like some filters. So GOS, um, grad gradient-based one-side sampling, is an effective sampling technique uh, that helps to reduce the number of data points. So it makes sense. And okay. um, the EFB, so the exclusive feature bundling, uh, gonna reduce uh, the number of features uh, by grouping, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mutually exclusive features, uh, treating them as a single feature. So the idea is you're gonna work both on the uh, number of data points and on the uh, number of features. And nice. uh, yeah, that's you, you see the intuition is simple. And uh, thanks to this combination, um, the author of uh, the light uh, GBM algo shows that uh, this algo can significantly outperform uh, XJ Boost and uh, the LGB, so the stochastic gradient, uh, in terms of computational speed and uh, memory consumption. Uh, in their, so the results are in their paper. Okay, yeah, I understand the, the, the intuition. Uh, reduce the number of uh, data points and, and, and reduce or combine features just to, re to reduce the number of dimensions to the problem. Exactly. Uh, okay, that's, that's very clever. And uh, I'm sure that helps with the uh, training speed for sure, you know, because you have fewer data points and, and fewer columns, so it should go faster. Um, what about accuracy? Um, do, we, do we also get uh, um, perform, uh, an accuracy improvement uh, compared to other, other implementations? So you can have um, a, 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 a little more, a, a little bit more of accuracy, but uh, the idea is um, so it improves the accuracy and the speed of training. And mm -hmm. uh, why? Uh, how is it? Uh, how it is? Um, how can it be done? Is that um, GBT algos, um, GBDT algos typically grow. Um, uh, trees with a level-wise uh, strategy. On mm -hmm. the other side, uh, like, GBD, like GBM, use a leaf-wise tree uh, growth uh, strategy. So two okay. different An ways. Another question I'm regretting by now. But uh, <laughs> all right, we actually have a slide to explain this. Uh, so let me show that slide. 
okay. the level wise versus the liquid. So wise. level wise, basically, it's, we're stacking, right? We're stacking exactly. uh, levels or, or we're going depth, depth first, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you remember your uh, tree traversal algos from uh, uh, your junior year, you worked on that, right? Uh, so <laughs> it's it's depth first. So stacking stacking layers on the tree, and and light GBM actually grows trees um, in the other in the other direction. And mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of crazy math associated to this, and you know why that it's actually uh, it's actually better. Uh, and and uh, yeah, you can read there's there's a, um, a great summary in the light GBM documentation, and of course the the research paper. Okay, um, so I think we understand light GBM a little better. So to, to sum things up, it's a very versatile algo, just like XJBoost, uh, but it's it uses crazy fancy techniques to speed up training and um and get to in some cases get to higher accuracy um so that's that's pretty cool of course we're going to use um uh, an existing implementation and we're going to use it with scikit learn as you mentioned right mm -hmm. so let me let's take a look at the training script start to look at some code here um all right so we're going to focus on the on the most uh, important bits. Um, so this is a, a, a scikit-learn script that we're going to run inside a scikit-learn container on SageMaker. We're actually building a custom container because we need to have LightGBM installed. We need to have Shape installed. Um, and yeah, there are tricks to to do this with a standard uh, built-in container, but here we're using a custom container. So let's quickly look at the training function per se. Here it is, which is pretty simple, and because it's scikit-learn, and it's it's always very nice and neat with scikit-learn, which is why I like it so much. So first, of course, we load the data. Um, and the data is uh, is organized in different data sets. So, of course, we have the training data, the testing data, and the training labels, and uh, the testing labels. Uh, and we have the actual data and the schema, right? Um, so, I showed you I showed you those files already. Okay. So, we load those from locations that are passed to the script by SageMaker. And uh, this is called script mode. I think we uh, we discussed script mode before, which is a very simple way to uh, uh, run your framework code on SageMaker, receiving hyperparameters and dataset location on the command line. Right? If you've never heard about script mode, you can go and read about it on the in the documentation. But that's really what it is. Uh, we just pass hyperparameters and dataset location to the script on the command line. Right, so we read them as command line arguments. Okay, uh, then we have very simple pre-processing. Um, I'm not going to show you the function. I'm just going to explain what it does. So it it uh, uh, it actually converts all numerical values to 32-bit uh, floating points, just casting them to floating point, and it uh, one out encodes categorical variables. Right, that's it. So that's that's what it does. It's it's a literally a five line function. Then we create the the actual classifier, okay, and we have some parameters here. So I think Sego, we're going to uh, need a bit of uh, help here. So max depth, okay, that's how deep the tree is, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, this uh, high parameter is super important, especially when you want to deal, uh, to, to fight the potential uh, over fighting uh, the mm. aspect and, uh, of uh, trees, uh, especially when your data is small. So yes, you can uh, play with this uh, hyper parameter. Uh, yeah, keep the tree small enough not to come up with crazy splits that could be very accurate on the training data, but really mean nothing exactly. in the real. Oh, exactly. overfitting is, uh, is always a problem. Okay, so this is uh, this is okay. Uh, number of leaves. Uh, I guess number again, of leaves, just the maximum number of leaves on the tree. So again, keep, keep the tree small enough. Simple. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially again, if you have like a small data and you want to uh, avoid um, overfitting. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, this one I think is the number of trees, right? Number of estimators. 
So how many how many trees are we actually building? Mm -hmm. uh, mean child samples. What what is this thing? Is mi uh, the minimal number of data uh, in one leaf, and again, uh, this is a parameter to uh, to play with when you want to uh, deal with a potential uh, overfitting risk. Okay, and boosting type. So boosting type, I would expect, is uh, uh, what algo do we use to actually build the gradient boosting uh, elements, right? How do those trees actually predict together? Yeah, exactly. And um, if you want to, to know more about that, uh, have a look at the documentation. Uh, mm -hmm. You will see that you have different types of um, tree boosting type. Uh, the default one is the GB, GBDT. And uh, in our case, we are going to use the DART uh, one, which is which means uh, dropouts meet multiple multiple additive regression trees. But uh, again, depending on the data, etc., you can play uh, with this kind of um, hyperparameter. Okay, and if you want to try that crazy GOS thing, then you can actually set it here, right? Okay, exactly. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so I think we're good on hyperparameters. Um, then we use a standard scikit-learn pipeline um, mm -hmm. to combine that pre-processing step and that uh, training step, right? And then we basically train the pipeline on the training set. And then we run uh, the test set through the pipeline and to get some, uh, some metrics, I, I'm, I guess I'm guessing, and then we save the model. Um, in uh, in scikit-learn in joblib format actually, uh, in the location passed by again you can see here passed as a um, as a command line argument. So, right, this is really vanilla uh, vanilla scikit-learn. And the, again, the only difference is we read hyperparameters and uh, data set and model path on the command line, and we use that inside the script. So if you have existing scikit-learn code, it's very very easy to adapt it and and make it run on SageMaker. Okay, so I think we're good on the training part. Um, so, what metric will we use for this uh, for this model? What's the what's an appropriate metric here? Uh, so, uh, like GBM uh, supports uh, lots of different metrics, but uh, here uh, in our case, we are going to use the A AUC, the area under curve, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, really a good metric uh, for binary uh, classifier. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good place to start. And once again, uh, our focus today is not to get the maximum accuracy. Our focus is to train a model that we can go and explain. Uh -huh. explain. Okay, so we have a data set. We have an algorithm. We have training code. So let's put all those bricks together and let's train the model. Okay, so let me uh, let me switch to uh, let me switch to the training notebook right so yeah just a quick so this example is broken into a number of uh, a number of notebooks um, the first notebook is the data set generation okay so pretty much what i explained earlier uh, starting from the uh, uh, the lambda generated data with faker and then we run the glue job and we end up with that json file and that uh, json schema that i showed you okay so that's part one and part two is training okay so now we have this data in s3 and we need to train so i mentioned we would create uh, a custom container so i think we showed this uh we showed this in a previous episode. I can't remember on the top of my head which one that was, but I know we, sh we did show you uh, how <laughs> to create custom containers. Um, and um, and we remember we ran a number of uh, AWS command line uh, APIs to create a, a Docker repository and uh, and then to um, uh, push, uh, create, build the image, push it, to uh, Amazon ECR, our, our Docker registry service, etc. So we could do the same, but I think um, this example, you know, from a functional perspective, does exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, but instead of running the uh, AWS CLI calls in the notebook, and then, again, there's nothing wrong with that, um, it's actually using another AWS service called um, CodeBuild. 
and code build is a managed service that lets you build pretty much anything. It's completely agnostic uh, with respect to uh, the language you're using, the, the 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 technology you're using. So you can use it to build, uh, you know, C++ apps, and you can use it to build Docker containers, and you can use it for pretty much everything, uh, because you pass a build script, and this is where you know the the real magic happens. Um, and so again, code build is very uh, is very interesting. I will just give you a super um, where's my code build window? Here it is. Okay, uh, I'll give you a, a quick overview, and you can go and, and zoom in on code build if you're interested. Uh, so we start with a with a project, and um, and so I've got a project here, and this project. Uh, so of course you get all the logging and you know inform you know lifecycle information that you, you could want. Uh, you can trigger builds, you can see metrics, you know, you get lots of stuff. Um, but most importantly, you see, um, yeah, so you see all the details here, right? And what it comes down to is the the build script that you pass. And this is it, right? So you have to provide when you create your project you have to provide a yaml file which is called a build specification here's the one we're using here and uh, and this is pretty much the description of the build process and the commands you want to run so this is a really really simple one uh it only has two phases which is install some dependencies and then build uh, but you can have you can have more steps than this and of course the commands that we use here are the exact same commands that we used when we were running those things in the notebook, right? So, uh, create, uh, log into, uh, log into, uh, our ECR registry and then build the image and tag it and push it, et cetera, et cetera. So if you've never used that code build and you end up, uh, you know, you find yourself building labs, or building containers a lot of time, uh, and, and, and you want to do this on manage infrastructure and simplify everything. And automate everything. Code build is a is a really good way to do it. Very very nice service. And of course, it's fully integrated with code deploy. So uh, if we were pushing this container to uh, to a cluster, right? If we're pushing this to ECS or EKS, we could do this, and we can build pipelines uh, to automate everything. So again, all those tools are are interesting, and you know they kind of make sense here as well. Okay, so this is how we build our container this is the script right pretty simple now let's go back to uh, let's go back to the notebook so here we see the output of that container okay so code build succeeded push the container to amazon ecr uh, we've seen this before and then we're back into sagemaker territory and this is sagemaker <laughs> as usual right um, we use the scalar and estimator okay from the sagemaker sdk we pass the name of the the image we just built uh, we pass the script so here we have an entry point script uh, for uh, for training uh, which basically calls the the train function that i just show you showed you before it's it's nothing particular here uh, hyperparameters, how much infrastructure do we want to train on, and all the paths for the model, and uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's nothing nothing really new here, right? Uh, the only thing here we have some uh, extra parameters like source gear and dependencies because we want to inject uh, extra source files and potentially extra dependencies. Uh, we have a homemade uh, package here that we want to load in the script, so we can use those uh, um, uh, estimator parameters to pass them to the to the entry point. But that's that's about it. Okay, so same old, same old. Create the estimator. Call fit right, passing the different channels. So I think uh, Sego so far we in all the examples we've used, I think we only had two one or two channels, right? I think we had training and test, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, and so sometimes people ask me, oh, can I have more? And the answer is yes, you can have more. <laughs> so here we can see five <laughs> channels. Um, so we have uh, training data, test data, training labels, test labels, and the schemas, right? So that the script mm -hmm. can uh, uh, understand um, 
which type each uh, feature has for that simple processing that it's applying. But yeah, you can pass multiple channels and you could, uh, if your training data is broken into different pieces and it's all over S3, you could have, you know, training channel one, training channel two, etc. cetera. It, it, it works okay. Okay, so we call fit. And again, it's business as usual. We trained for 75 seconds. Uh, again, we did not set up spot training here, but we could save some money by doing that. We showed you this in a previous example, so go and go and view, uh, look at those. Uh, so, Sego, you told us we would use the area under curve, so we get there, mm -hmm. right? We get to almost uh, eighty percent. Is is that okay? <laughs> yeah, it's <like> super okay. <laughs> super okay. All right. All right. No, if you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> after again the, 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 the metrics are relative so you need to create first a baseline and after you're gonna use uh, try different hyperparameters and you will see um, which one uh, can improve the accuracy etc uh, again it's different about the, the about the data and here in our case uh, it's not so bad okay yeah for a first uh, first attempt um, 80 percent uh -huh. is pretty good okay so we have a model the model is in s3 and uh, now we can deploy it, right? So um, how do we deploy it this time? Uh, so this time we are going to deploy uh, to a real-time uh, endpoint. And after mm -hmm. uh, we will predict uh, with a custom script uh, using a shape okay. <laughs> to return the feature, uh, feature importance. Okay. All right. So we're... Yeah, so we're almost at the end of the of the workflow here, right? So yeah, uh, exactly. Again, okay, generate data generation, training, and now deploying and predicting. And, predicting. and again, it's it's, it's, it's pretty cool. To, yeah, it's pretty cool to combine <laughs> all those services, right? I think this is a this is a really a really fun way to um, to do it and efficient as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, we looked at endpoints before, so we're, of course we're going to look at prediction, but it's nothing. It's nothing new. Uh, we've seen this before. So again, uh, let's focus on on shape. Okay. So it's a bit of a it's a very popular topic, but it's a bit of a mysterious topic as well. Um, and if it's the first time you hear about it, you know it sounds a little uh, a little strange. So Sego, we need your help once again. So what is shape, um, and how does it help? Right. Uh, how, why is this a good tool for explainability? Tell us more. <laughs> um, so, uh, what, first, what does it mean? Uh, so, shape, <laughs> not sharp, uh, stands for uh, Shapley um, Additive Explanation. Um, where does it come uh, from? So, Shapley relates uh, to a gain theory concept called uh, Shapley values uh, okay. that is used to create explanation. Um, in mm -hmm. So, in game theory, a Shapley value describes the marginal contribution of each player when considering, considering all possible coalitions. So, the idea uh, mm. is, yes, to, 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 to capture some weight, some kind of weight, uh, when you consider the world, uh, the, uh, the world of all possible. And so, again, mm -hmm. from, from uh, game theory, it's not a, a new uh, concept, but when it is used uh, in uh, within the machine learning concept context, um, the Shapley value describes the marginal uh, contribution of each feature when considering all possible sets of features. So, yeah. and uh, you, uh, after the additive uh, stuff uh, of the name relates to the fact that these Shapley values uh, can be summed together to give the final model prediction. Mm. In a nutshell, what does it mean? It means that the contribution of each feature is a positive or negative number that either increase or decrease the predicted outputs. So, you can okay. see... Yeah, it's like very, again, the intuition is very simple. You, 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 you just need to have a way to, to do it, and uh, Shapley uh, can help you uh, in this case. Okay, so in our yeah. case, yeah, the output is, uh, is a probability, right? The output mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, a, um, a, well, it's a yes or no problem, but in fact, it's going to be a, a zero, one uh, probability uh, on your credit risk, right? Um, zero means uh, you're a, a super safe uh, customer, yeah. and 100% means you will 
certainly you know uh, default on your uh, on your, uh, yeah. your credit and and that's not good and, and now so if i understand correctly so shape will actually say this feature and the value the value of this feature for this specific customer is increasing or decreasing the predicted credit default right that's what we're exactly. doing exactly okay. yeah so we can see we can see values for each individual uh sample for each the uh each individual uh data point right yeah exactly um, once you, you train your model you're gonna have your result and after you're gonna be able to see uh, for each individual um uh, okay of, uh, <laughs> all right okay i get i understand the uh, i think i get the intuition okay and of course you can you can read all about it here and uh and and go and try uh shape uh with your own code uh and of course we're going to use it with our model so let's go back to the let's go to the prediction notebook now and okay there's a little bit of a uh, moving stuff around because we have multiple notebooks but what we're really doing here is uh, we're getting that model uh that we just trained okay and uh yeah maybe i should explain this so if if all of it was running inside the same notebook right <laughs> we would just call estimator.deploy right in the previous notebook okay just like we've done in in all the other examples now here here we're we're running this in a different notebook so we don't have access to that estimator object right mm -hmm. um so we have to actually kind of rebuild that uh, that context and we use this sklearn model uh, object again from the SageMaker sdk which is going to go and reference the the train model that we we used in the previous notebook and create an estimator object where we can actually go and and uh, and call deploy right or oh, it's a model object but it has a deploy function okay so it's a good technique uh, because you know the the way we run those demos is a little bit artificial all the time because we have the the a to z workflow but a lot of time you know maybe you, you maybe you're training on monday and then on tuesday wednesday you want to deploy and uh, and experiment so this is how you can go and uh, deploy or redeploy models that have been trained right you create a model object and then you call deploy on that okay a little bit of a SageMaker content here Okay, and then we deploy as usual on a C5 Excel instance. We wait for a few minutes and we have an endpoint. Okay, so now we're ready to predict, right? Uh, and again, we're using a custom container for this. And uh, let me show you quickly the, the prediction script. Um, so we have a model function and the model function is responsible for loading the model so when the endpoint comes up uh, SageMaker will call that model fn uh, function to actually load the model okay so that's what we're uh, we're doing here you can see it here right we load everything and we instantiate that and here we are we have a model ready to go okay uh okay we have a little bit of a technical code here um so there's a little bit of pre-processing um, to uh, to make sure we actually pass the data, uh, the incoming data in a format that LightGBM can predict with. And then there's the predict function. Okay, and it, it's a little complicated um, because it's uh, you know, it's taking into account different scenarios. Uh, what we're really doing here is we are uh, predicting uh, we are predicting with the model. Uh, where is that predict function? Uh, oh, here it is. Okay, all right. So we, we predict the probabilities on the features. Okay, and uh, and then we output all the shape information, and uh, we're going to look at it. So m most of this is 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 really vanilla uh, vanilla shape code. It looks a little bit uh, it looks a little bit complicated because we, again we're accounting for uh, different uh, different scenarios, different prediction scenarios. But you can you can certainly simplify this for your own example. And again, the the shape uh, repo has some examples, and uh, you can you can go and run those first. Maybe this one is a little too advanced for for today. Okay.
So this is what we're doing here, right? So we're receiving data, putting it in a format that uh, our algo understands, and then predict, and then uh, use shape to extract uh, the information. So let's take a sample here, right? So here's a sample customer. Uh, and again, we see all those features here, okay? So that's your... Uh, uh, Joe customer or Jane customer, and we're going to predict, right? So we predict uh, and just predict, push that data to the HTTP endpoint that we created. And we see we have a default risk of 27.62%, right? So, you know, if, if you say no to my dishwasher credit and saying, sorry, there's a 27% chance you're going to default on your dishwasher loan, that's, that's not working for me, right? So, uh, and, and, and plus, it, it, doesn't say, it doesn't tell the whole story. So, this is how Shape is actually Shape. working, right? So, there's yeah. some nice visualization here. We're just going to jump to the, uh, to the, the actual graph. So what do we see here? Okay, 27% Sego is the okay the, the, the actual output. What are those uh, red and, and green bars here? What do they mean? So again, it's, it's, they are based on a kind of shapeless, shapeless score uh, mm -hmm. based on each. So here it's like the um, family of uh, each feature, so personal, mm -hmm. contact, residence, etc. And after, depending of the score and the contribution of each feature on the output of your model, you're going to be able to see which one has the most uh, impact oh. on the decision of your bank. And okay, the, so for, um, so okay, so if I understand correctly, so this, uh, so the, the the features in the employment category actually seem to increase the risk pretty much, uh, pretty pretty large, right? In a pretty large way, it's like plus five or plus six percent, and exactly. the finance features kind of reduce the risk pretty much, right? Uh, 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 so uh, employment, let's look at employment for that guy. Yeah, employment duration zero, uh, I would say. Okay. okay, so he has no employment history. So, yeah, you could see why this is not very reassuring, right, for, for credit. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, yeah, okay. finance, finance is... is the family of okay, finance. Okay, so these yeah. are the... Yeah. yeah, finance is, is as a positive uh, impact, you could say. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So these are the high level categories where well, remember we saw them uh, we saw them in, in the schema here, right? So we can actually go and see the detailed explanation where we see each individual feature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so okay, so what we see here is the actual feature. So uh, so for example, this uh, yeah, employment duration, right? Zero is looks like a very negative uh, factor, Effects. right? Factor, yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, so the banker could tell me, sorry, you have no employment history, I won't lend you the money, yeah. right? <laughs> Which, you know, okay, I would still wouldn't be happy about it, but at least it's, <laughs> it's kind of a reasonable, uh, if I challenge the decision, they could go and say, well, sir, this is what it is, right? It's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's our policy to say no in 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 this uh, it, it, with this customer profile. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think what it is really interesting is like you know uh, uh, ML model are seen as like black box. You put some data in and you've got an output uh, out. And here, thanks to this kind of um, thanks to this kind of Shapley uh, Shapley values, um, mm -hmm. you can understand the uh, decision made by the algorithm, okay. and you can visualize, which is good. <laughs> Okay, so here I just printed out those actual values, of course. You can see there, this is exactly what we saw on the graph, right? It's the feature name and the actual, uh, the actual shape, uh, shape value that we have here. So as a, as, a, as a last example, if we try to switch, uh, you know, let's try to change one feature. So for example, this customer doesn't have a checking account, right? The, the, the one we predicted with. So now let's just change the feature and say that customer does have a checking account and the balance is negative, right? Mm -hmm. So that doesn't sound too good, right? I think uh, our banker <laughs> is not going to be super happy with this. So now, right, Sego, you spend too much. Like me, you spend too much. 
uh, and uh, we buy too much stuff on uh, on Amazon during lockdown. Exactly. And, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we are negative. So if we predict again, uh, yeah, wow, yeah, okay. I'm good. <laughs> you can see the credit risk is now fifty percent. Okay, so that's a huge jump, and we can see that this feature, right, which is here. Uh, right, uh, so negative uh, negative uh, savings uh, is uh, is actually not helping us at all. Right, so everything <laughs> everything looks bad here. Right, yeah. so we can see. <laughs> yeah, good luck. And and it's also so we see individual values, but if we um, if we did this for thousands and thousands of customers, and if we averaged everything, then we could see feature importance as well. We could say, well, the, the feature in, in, you know, on average, the feature that contributes, the feature value that contributes most negatively is, let's say, um, uh, employment duration, right? So if your employment mm -hmm. duration is zero or less than 12, it's very, very negative for your credit uh, uh, approval. So we can understand which features are impactful, which are not. And, and you know, sometimes it's also a way to detect potential bias, um, right? So if, if, if okay. age was a feature, uh, and you could see, okay, if you're, uh, you know, if you're over 45, uh, you, you know, your credit and at, Everything being equal, if, if you're older, your chance of getting a credit is not as good, right? Even though the risk is identical to a 25-year-old, uh, you could say, well, you know, maybe I'm being, you know, treated uh, unfairly here, right? Maybe we're treated unfairly. So bias is a totally different story, but uh, shapely values are one way to understand what could be, you know, going a little sideways in your model, right? So it's a very, very... Uh, technique okay i think we're uh, we're almost out of time so let me show you the last slide and with the resources the one that you want to uh take a screenshot of okay right so all all the the usual ones the the sage maker and um uh, uh, URLs and uh, here's the repo that we used, uh, the faker information, the light GBM paper, the light GBM and Shapely um, docs as well. Um, don't forget, reInvent is coming this year uh, in a few weeks. It's free and uh, we hope to see you there. It's going to be a lot of uh, cr great, great content and of course SageMaker content. And I mentioned it so many times, it's uh, it's embarrassing now, but uh, I have this uh, SageMaker <laughs> book out. Uh, the only reason I'm mentioning it is because for a few more weeks you can get a good discount uh, and uh, on the paper edition and the ebook edition. So uh, I'll leave it on for a few more seconds so that you can take a screenshot. Thank you everybody for watching us again today. Thank you Sego for the invaluable explanation on uh, <laughs> data science and machine learning. I, I learned a lot today again. Next week, we're going to switch topics and we will talk about natural language processing um, and uh, we'll talk about a technique called topic modeling, which is pretty cool. It's a non-supervised learning technique to group um, lookalike uh, or related documents and we'll use the Amazon reviews data set, which is very fun to work with. So there's going to be a lot of crazy stuff to <laughs> learn again. So make sure to join us next week. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Sego. Uh, thank, you thank you to uh, all our AWS colleagues who helped with uh, this uh, session today. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you. We hope everybody had a great time and uh, we can't wait to see you next week. Until then, if you're uh, in lockdown, stay safe. You know, be reasonable. Don't do anything stupid. Uh, <laughs> take care of your loved ones read about machine learning you have some extra time since you're not going out and partying so <laughs> lots of time to learn and study and keep rocking with machine learning and see you next week bye 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 <laughs>